Growing up within a high control religious environment can leave a whole host of traumatic experiences in the wake of someone's development, especially as it relates to sex. Today on Get Naked with Dr. Kate, I'll be speaking with Julia Postema and Jeremiah Gibson, who are the co-hosts of the podcast, Sex Evangelicals, the sex education the church didn't want you to have. They're both Boston-based licensed psychotherapists and certified sex therapists, and they specialize in helping couples with negative religious backgrounds discover sexuality that works within their partnership. I'm so excited, Julie and Jeremiah, to have you here. It's time to get naked with Dr. Kate. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Balistrieri, a Beverly Hills-based psychologist, certified sex therapist, and the founder of Modern Intimacy, a national therapy group. So let's dive into all things sex, relationships, mental health, and answer your questions with practical solutions and real answers. Each week, I'll share insights to help you build a healthy relationship with yourself, with other people, and with your sexuality. It's time to start thriving authentically. So let's get naked. And if you like this podcast, hit the download button so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to leave five stars and a review. Hi, thanks so much for joining me today. I've been really excited to speak with you and learn more about your journey together. Can you maybe start by by telling us a little bit about how you even came to be. Yeah. Well, our podcast is uh, Sex Evangelicals, the sex mm-hmm. education that the church didn't want you to have. Mm-hmm. We are also both certified sex therapists and licensed psychotherapists. Mm-hmm. And the two of us met in Boston when we were already practicing as mm-hmm. therapists. And mm-hmm. we learned that we had some overlapping backgrounds in uh, high control religious environments. And mm-hmm that both impacted us quite significantly as individuals in former relationships. The more that we continued to practice sex therapy and the more that our relationship developed, we realized that sadly our stories and the impact of religious systems on our lives were not particularly unique to folks Mm -hmm. uh, from other high control religious environments. And Mm -hmm. we wanted to be able to have opportunities outside of the therapy room to be able to talk about the relational impact of mm-hmm. different religious systems and how we can have better, more flourishing sexuality in partnerships. Yeah. yeah. Well, let, let's back up even before that, right? What You both grew up in high control religious environments. So what for you, like, how did each of you start to question the environments that you were in? What was the process that you went through to even begin a, a, a curiosity about changing the way you looked at life, looked at faith, looked at sex? I imagine there were kernels and maybe explosions of insight. So what was the process? Therapy training definitely helped. <laughs> so Julia and I are both systems informed uh, therapists. So mm-hmm. I'm a marriage and gender therapist. Julia is a clinical social worker. Um, so learning more about how systems work and for, for me in graduate school uh, really helped me question and, and, and have a completely different framework for how to see the world than I had learned in the 23 years prior to that and, and primarily in religious systems. So for, for me, learning more about uh, relationship dynamics, learning more about power structures, how, how uh, power happens and, and doesn't happen in, in larger systems, that was, a, uh, th- that was a big turning point for me. I have some similarities to that in the sense that when I studied social work in college, I began to question certain parts of the worldview of my growing up experiences mm-hmm. more on the political spectrum. And that included um, advocacy and civil rights for, for queer folks. However, I thought that that was the indication that I had done the work that I needed to do in unpacking negativity around sexuality. However, several years later, after getting married and getting married quite young, I became very disillusioned around everything that I had learned with sexuality, with relationships, with marriage. I tell folks that I was a client in sex therapy before I became a sex therapist. Mm -hmm. And after I got married, my world really crumbled, which sounds dramatic, 
but it, it wasn't. And that's actually the experience that so many women who grow up in uh, religiously traumatic environments uh, experience because mm-hmm. you learn that your identity as a woman is to get married as soon as possible, to get married having followed the rules around purity culture. And, and then you will have a blissful, magical marriage, including sexuality. When that didn't happen for me, it was far more than sexual disappointment, sexual pain, both emotional and physical, but it was the idea that my identity no longer existed. So uh, my ex-husband and I found an incredible sex therapist. And even though we did decide to get divorced years later, the sex therapist that we saw in Boston was a phenomenal woman. I think about her quite often. She very much shaped my understanding of relationships and sexuality. However, in my first therapy session with her, she asked about my background. And I remember saying, well, I grew up in this very fringy kind of community. It was strange. Lots of weird things happened. But I really don't think it impacted my sexuality all that much. I think about that moment all the time because now as a practicing sex therapist, I imagine that I would have a lot of thoughts and feelings. And my therapist, Nancy, really paced our work quite well, but it was in the process of being a client in sex therapy and then studying sex therapy that my my worldview shifted in more dramatic ways. I really appreciate you saying that. I think a lot of folks don't always understand the ways that growing up in any kind of high control environment can really impact their sex lives. There's a huge disconnect and all of a sudden something sexually feels wanting or it feels painful or it feels remiss or it's not as expected. And it, it can be really hard to understand the earlier links from, from growing up that play a huge role in shaping our identities and our relationship with power, our relationship with expression. Like there's so much that implicitly is learned that influences how we express and experience sex later in life. Mm-hmm. Certainly. Absolutely. Yeah. Not just talking about the things that we learn growing up, but also when we begin to learn new information, that in and of itself can create a different kind of, of crisis for a lot of folks. Mm-hmm. Um, an existential crisis about, oh, I participated in these systems. I invested all this time, all this energy in these systems. And it didn't get me very far. It actually brought me a lot of pain. It brought me a lot of, uh, in, in my case, it brought me a lot of avoidance, um, a lot of communication skills, or communication strategies, looking back. And I'm like, mm, not great, Jeremiah. <laughs> uh, and, and so, you know, there, there's the individual reckoning mm-hmm. with that. There's the grief and, and, and the loss that comes with uh, lost relationships. Julia mm-hmm. and I divorced. Uh, from uh, marriages that stemmed from evangelical communities. Um, We've both had to say goodbye to uh, a lot of different people uh, in church communities and family communities as a result of uh, some of the some of the positions, some of the values that we take around sexuality. Mm -hmm. I'm going to steal one of the lines that you often use in in podcast interviews, Julia. You've talked about how um, when we do sex therapy, and especially when we do sex therapy with folks who grew up in religion, there's also a high volume of work around grief and loss yeah. that we have to be aware of. Well, let's let's talk about that a little bit more, if you don't mind, because I think that is unconsciously one of the biggest barriers that a lot of folks have to making the changes that they want to make, because there's this knowing, right? There's a knowing of what comes with that, that perhaps there's no vocabulary around, but the grief can be really profound. And I'm really curious in both of your experiences, how did you recognize it as grief? How did you begin to process that grief? And at the end of the day, was it worth it? When I got married and my world and sense of self crumbled, I believe that was my entrance into grief, but I didn't know that it was grief. I was really confused. I remember thinking, I shouldn't be this devastated, or why am I this devastated? How is it that what happens in a sexual experience with my husband could create distress that pervaded really every part of my lived experience? 
only in sex therapy and really only years later have I been able to tap into that as a significant loss and a loss mm -hmm. that deserves time and attention. Grief can look different for all of us. For mm -hmm. me, that might be therapy sessions or a long walk with a friend or a lot of tears. We sometimes think about grief in these really beautiful kinds of ways. You have a moment on your yoga mat or you go on a retreat and have an epiphany. Sometimes that happens, but often it is trying to buy salad dressing at the grocery store and then being overcome by a tsunami of intense emotions. So the grief process looks really messy. Hopefully we can create spaces for that to happen in, I suppose, more convenient ways. That's part of therapy, right? Is holding space for an individual or a couple or a different relationship system to be able to sit with that and know that you're not holding it alone. Those moments are great. And many of the moments are not quite as pretty. And I'm drawing Kate to you, the third question that you asked, which is, is it worth it? Mm -hmm. And in thinking about that question, I'm thinking, Julia, about the work that you and I have done with sex evangelicals. And we, we started the podcast with a series called The Seven Deadly Sins According to the Church. And the mm -hmm. seven deadly sins of the church all center around the word don't. Mm -hmm. uh, don't have sex before you get married. Don't be gay. Don't have wants. Don't talk about sex. Mm. And that was very central, the, 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 the language of don't, to the language of repress, the language of avoid was very central to the person that I was when I was more engaged in religious systems. Mm. And to answer your question, was it worth it? Well, I think that, yes, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of grief. And I also think that the Jeremiah of today is, making decisions, communicating in ways that are much more aligned with my values of who I want to be mm. today than I was seven years ago, let's say, when I was still somewhere in the middle of religious systems. So. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that answer. I think it, it is a question that comes up a lot when I'm helping folks process where they want to be in their own deconstruction work and their own deconstruction process. And I can say for myself, I started deconstructing when I was a teenager, um, growing up in a very um, strict Catholic family, wasn't a good fit for me. And so I started questioning things when I was really, really young. And that caused a lot of ripple effects in my whole family system. So for a long time, the, the grieving process has felt elongated. Um, there are moments of pause, there are moments of reprieve, there are moments of joy, but I think that that grief can be something that lingers, right, with different milestones and different moments in life where you think about everything that comes from embarking on the process of deconstructing in a great way, in an enlivening way, and also the things that um, maybe can never be because of what you have to say goodbye to or walk away from. Absolutely. Certainly. And for me, it was worth it. Mm -hmm. However, in some ways, I'm, I'm lucky I have and had certain privileges. For example, I lost many relationships when I deconstructed and ultimately got divorced. However, I did have some friends outside of mm -hmm. religious. Systems. Not everybody has that. I had a successful career. Not everybody has that. Mm -hmm. So although it was like, painful as hell to have some of the experiences uh, that I had and the berating and shame from people who I thought were in my corner. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had ways of surviving outside of those systems. Mm -hmm. And when I talk with clients, uh, I, I always tell them, my stake is in your flourishing as a human being, and you might only have hard choices here. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say this to a client, but even though I have chosen to move out of a religious system, that might not be the right choice for you, or it might not be a choice that you can access for a whole host of reasons. Mm -hmm. So each person has such a different, complex set of 
questions and consequences to consider. Mm -hmm. Like you said, the ripple effects are are huge. Mm -hmm. When I got divorced, that was a grenade in my family system. Divorce isn't always a grenade in family systems, but it was for me. And uh, that among many things was, was quite painful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you, uh, how, how did the two of you, when you met, start this conversation and, and like, how did your deconstructing continue now that you are in a different relationship with someone who's on a similar journey? I think Julia, you and I met at a really unique time for both of us. Um, so in evangelical communities, the marital relationship is like the primary relationship. And both of us, when we met, like our marital relationships were very much on the rocks. My own relationship, I was uh, attempting to, for, for years, to get my ex to, uh, to go to a couples therapy, to sex therapy, uh, to talk about and, and to address just the painful shit that we navigated, that, that, that we both like dealt with, that, that I think I was more willing to acknowledge was painful than my ex was. It's really hard to work on a marriage when only one person wants to work on it. Yeah. And so I was at that point, Julia, you were at a unique point in your uh, relationship. And both of us were kind of answering questions about, yeah, like, what is it like to, you know, what is it like to end this? What is it like to uh, kind of uh, move out of these primary relationships? And in doing so, another metaphor that you use is a Jenga tower. Oh, yeah. Uh, that uh, at, at some point, both of us had kind of pulled out the final uh, uh, Jenga blocks and the towers both kind of came crashing down at around the same time. And, you know, I was fortunate, Julia, to be able to kind of navigate that, uh, those initial, uh, the entire crumbling of the tower with you uh, and, and to be able to talk about how hard it was to, uh, talk about my grief, to talk about things I was oblivious to really prior to that. I think I had much more obliviousness about some stuff, Julia, than you did. I think that I always knew conceptually how misogynistic purity culture was, mm -hmm. but I didn't really, really, really understand it until Julia, you and I started talking about uh, some of the overt ways that purity culture uh, began messing with you. Uh, and then being able to see that like in my uh, former uh, marriage and then in other uh, relationships that I had. Um, I think there's some, um, I think there's probably some male privilege there, obviously, that uh, <laughs> that prevented me from seeing that in, in particular ways. As we began talking, uh, as we began eventually moving into a dating relationship, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of alignment between you and I about how important it is for us to be able to engage with, first with religious systems, and then... Uh, more importantly, like folks, the uh, folks who are moving out of religious systems, kind of this burgeoning evangelical community that's developed in the last uh, in the last five years, uh, and, and and the more that we've done our podcast, the more we've talked with other people. I think uh, to answer your other question about how do we like continue the deconstruction journey, like for me, the answer to that question is is getting to know more people and getting to hear more stories, getting to hear Kate your story, and getting to hear other people's stories of how. Uh, religion and, and religious systems have, have really limited and really hurt people. I don't think the deconstruction process ends. Uh, we are constantly right. unlearning, relearning, healing, and rehealing throughout the, the course of the lifespan. In purity culture, one of the biggest myths is that as soon as you get married, uh, you are a free sexual person, and on your wedding night and on your honeymoon, you're going to have these blissful, magical experiences, which typically doesn't happen. And in the deconstruction world, a similar myth can exist, which is as soon as you stop going to church, or as soon as you leave a toxic religious space or a high control religious space, then you're going to have great sexual experiences, which is also often not true. So even years and years later, I find myself needing to unsubscribe again mm -hmm. from a message that was hurtful or harmful. And I describe it like an inbox where you receive this email and you know, I unsubscribed to this. I know that I did. 
how are they spamming me again? And I have to unsubscribe and unsubscribe. Those deeply rooted messages around sexuality, gender, and relationships still pop up. For example, we had a conversation recently and and you mentioned, well, Jules, if we are in a period of our relationship in which sexuality looks different for X number of reasons, like that is okay. And I, and, and my initial thought, well, is no, of course it's not okay because Mm -hmm. I need to ensure that I am performing my sexual role in these specific ways. Now I wouldn't use the same language that I would have learned growing up in church, but I had a different version of that. Mm -hmm. And that is just one example of the many different ways, multiple times a week that I reckon with some residue of evangelical messaging or purity culture messaging. How would you say your relationship with sex has changed, you know, in this process altogether in terms of like how you feel pleasure, where you still do have those unsubscribe moments? Um, Do they happen in the moment as frequently um, or are they more a, a cognitive interference somewhere in between your sexual experiences? Is it both? I would say a little bit of both. I I don't know if this is directly answering the question and I'm not trying to evade it, but something that has shifted in my understanding of sex Mm -hmm. is that it is simultaneously way better than I ever learned. Mm -hmm. And it also is not as important as I also learned because sexuality in Christian communities at in many Christian communities is really on a pedestal Mm -hmm. and it is this mysterious pedestal because nobody really talks about it in explicit kind of ways, but it's there. And we all know that it's there and we've got to perform these rules and roles to, to keep it at this platform. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so moving out of my marriage and experiencing sexuality in all different kinds of ways was so freeing, so empowering, so fun, really incredible. And it also doesn't define me. And sometimes it's really not all that important, depending on the day or the week. I was going to answer the question a similar way that I think I'm learning that sex is both like incredibly important as a window to all these different uh, different aspects of our lives, mm-hmm. uh, from the ways that we engage with ourselves to the ways that we communicate with other people, the ways that we engage with conflict, avoid conflict, and simultaneously, like not nearly as important as, for sure, as evangelical Christianity suggests, and 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 I would also acknowledge that not nearly as important as like the larger American zeitgeist uh, suggests sure. as mm-hmm. well. That um, I'm thinking about this as uh, as as a man where I learned. Uh, both in inside and outside of religious systems, that you know, my success, at success, whatever that means, as a man, is rooted in in, in sexual dominance, mm-hmm. uh, in a high high sexual libido, high sexual desire, a high quantity of sex, and I think that I have become more and more comfortable with with the reality that a it's not true, and b becoming more comfortable with, you know, the fact that my sexual desire, my sex, my, uh, the ways that sex gets desired for me, that it's great. It is what it is. I want to talk with you and continue to talk with you about this, but, but Julia, I'm fortunate to be in a relationship with you where, where you don't judge me for that. As long as I, uh, talk with you about what's going on for me and, and don't say anything like horrible, which I don't, <laughs> but, uh, and, and the third thing is um, thinking about this idea, uh, Lisa Diamond's work on sexual fluidity mm-hmm. has been really, really um, meaningful for me in recognizing, and recognizing, and not just from an orientation perspective, but just sexuality in general. Mm-hmm. My relationship with sex today is, is, is going to be different than it is this time next year. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean that I'm like psychologically ruined or that I need a DSM diagnosis, which just means that that stage in my life is different. And, and sex can be a good way to help check in to see kind of how other elements of my life are going, but you know, our relationship is going, but it's also not the end all be all. Right. I so appreciate both of your perspectives on that. Kind of a funny anecdote. 
Um, I was running errands yesterday and um, someone that I was chatting with asked me what I did for a living. And I said, oh, I'm a psychologist and a sex therapist. And this was a man um, who probably was interested in me and he got really big and puffy and he was like, oh, so do sex therapists have better sex since they know more about it, allegedly? <laughs> but I said, well, <clears throat> what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you know, compared to someone who has a lot of sex, right? Puffing up his own experience of bravado, oh. right? It was so transparent. And I just sort of said, yeah, I, th I think sex therapists can have better sex because they're more conscious about it and they have more knowledge about it. And I think one of the key points that a lot of sex therapists who I talk to will say is exactly what you said. We've sort of decentered the importance of sex in our lives, meaning it no longer defines our value as human beings. And when right. we create a path for sex in our lives that, that focuses on it as an activity, something fun to do, something that brings pleasure and joy, maybe connection, maybe not, um, but it, it just becomes another thing that we do, another way that we express ourselves. And it no longer defines who we are at our core, which I think is a huge remnant of purity culture for a lot of folks. You're either having a lot of sex and therefore you're great in some way, you're powerful, it's meaningful, or you're holding back your sexuality and that carries a lot of importance and virtue and, and morality. Well, I think that a lot of folks who grow up in high control environments tend to conflate their worthiness as humans to their relationship with sex. And that's one of the things that I think deconstructing really gives people the permission to do. It, it's just like, no, this is an enjoyable thing that has nothing to do with the quality of my character. And I think that's an important shift. I agree with that. Jeremiah and I went to the World Association for Sexual Health Conference in Turkey this fall. And I went to a training uh, about asexuality. If you remember the presenter's name, let me know because I want to give her credit. And I I went because it sounded interesting mm -hmm. and I have a few clients who would um, resonate with some of the concepts around asexuality. But what was so important from the training um, was that the presenter was trying to turn our general con or general understanding of sexuality on its head. And this exists even in the field of sexual health education and sexual mm -hmm. health therapy. And she was saying, what if we assumed that all folks were asexual versus assuming that all folks want to engage in some sort of sexual experiences? And she talked about the idea of compulsory sex sexuality, which is the idea that uh, people are inherently wired for sexual experiences and those sexual experiences look a certain way. And even outside of religious spaces, there can be a lot of pressure to uh, mm -hmm. having certain kinds of sex at certain kinds of frequency. And so I didn't expect the training to be so relevant to any person. And that was another way for me to wonder, okay, what have I sometimes missed as yeah. a sex therapist? And what would it be like if uh, we were all able to not have assumptions about what sexuality looks like in any relationship? It's freeing, it's liberating, and it's also creative to think about it that way. Because when we start from that blank slate place of not having assumptions or not having a prescription, then I think it really gives folks this beautiful ability to build something that feels really meaningful and pleasurable in a way that aligns with however important they want it to be. Right. They could breathe a sigh of relief. I had a couple that emailed me a thank you note uh, earlier this morning. I've been working with them for about a year, probably context, and uh, trying to like redefine what their relationship was. And they met early, they met early, early 20s in, in Arizona. Not religious people, but Arizona is a, a conservative state, so very mm -hmm. good that and, and as their relationship evolved realized uh, i don't know that like the the, the pressures around you know, what we've been told our relationship should be mm -hmm. i don't know that it really works for us and, and we had some hard sessions uh but they um they emailed me and said hey you know we just wanted to thank you we found something that's really meaningful for us we have breakfast every saturday and then we kind of go our separate ways and it's really really meaningful and and, and beautiful for us uh, and then we go do the rest of our day. Like, 
that they figured out like what the purpose of their relationship is at that particular moment of time. And maybe five years from now it changes. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, okay, that word freeing really stood out to me that yeah. this couple has the capacity to have a bunch of different options for what their relationship could look like and could hold. And, and through wrestling, through learning effective negotiation skills, mm -hmm. differentiation skills, uh, they were able to uh, to land on something that works for them. I understand that you are writing a book together about deconstruction. Is that right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. So we are in the very, very, very early, early stages. stages. But ultimately, the book will be a combination of memoir and qualitative research mm -hmm. examining what are the factors that support a couple who met within some sort of evangelical context, be that a church small group, a Christian, Christian college, University. or something else, and have decided together to no longer participate in those systems in a formal kind of way. That doesn't mean that the couple decided to do that at exactly the same time or pace, because that's one of the challenges that often mm -hmm. happens. So we want to consider, you know, how does the deconstruction process impact a couple who no longer chooses to participate in those systems in some really perhaps challenging ways like mental health, parenting, uh, et cetera, sexuality, of course. And then what are the factors that support the couple to be able to thrive when often that means the couple has to redefine the relationship. They have to start over because when a certain version of Christianity um, that highlights performance around gender lines is no longer present, then the couple has to figure out well, what does this relationship mean? Mm -hmm. What is it for this? And how are we going to create a new way of being together? Yeah. I think one of the challenges for couples in that situation can also be redefining the non-sexual parts of their relationship also, because in, in high control religion groups, there's such an emphasis on authority and leadership and power being placed with a male partner. And so when couples begin the deconstruction, they're often faced not only with reevaluating how they do things sexually together and what they want, but how are they going to negotiate and how do they move beyond this place of one person having the default say in what goes, the, tie the tiebreaker say. And that's a really hard thing, I think, for some couples to wrestle and navigate because it really shakes the foundation of how they view themselves in this partnership. In my experience working with, with couples, this is a space where there are a lot of unconscious internalized messages around how to be in love or in partnership. And I wonder if the two of you can maybe speak a little bit to whether or not that was present in your dynamic and how you've worked with yourselves or with folks in recognizing it and sort of stepping into a more egalitarian place. I don't know that I am a good example a good person to ask <laughs> my own personal experience because one of the reasons that I'm invested in writing this book is because my ex and I very poorly navigated this process. Mm. Uh, we, uh, I had gotten fired from a church a couple months uh, later, probably six months later. She had disclosed an affair. I disclosed an affair. And, uh, and then like the six months, uh, I'm sorry, the year that followed between uh, the disclosure of the affair and the actual divorce hearing were an absolute mess, mm. uh, a mess of avoidance, a mess of really petty things. One of the reasons that this book is really important is because I want to, I, I personally speaking, hope that learning about how couples come to an understanding of how to navigate these, these really massive differences. Mm -hmm. And, and differences in, in perspectives, differences in interests, differences in uh, emotional accessibility, mm -hmm. uh, a whole variety of things, sexual accessibility. How do couples kind of navigate that, that, that process? How do they communicate with each other what's going on? How do they, um, how do, do they continue to come back to conversations that are hard as opposed to having one conversation blow up and then never return to it? Mm. Um, like I'm really, really interested in hearing more from uh, for, from those couples. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's part of a healing process to uh, help um, understand more about the process that I didn't get. 
I'll answer that question by uh, shouting out to a friend of ours who has a recently published book uh, called Becoming Egalitarian, and it is written by a woman named Nikki Pellas. In my marriage, I was fortunate enough that uh, my ex-husband and I, I would say, had a, a very egalitarian relationship. And although sexuality was a massive point of conflict between the two of us, the gender hierarchy wasn't particularly prevalent in our relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm incredibly thankful for that. Uh, our friend Nikki, in her book, Becoming Egalitarian, talks about her journey um, of what you're describing in her relationship with her husband. And it's something that I discuss with couples in therapy quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Something uh, that Nikki discusses is that in her marriage, she and her husband didn't really fit the mold around uh, what Christian culture told them that a man and a woman, a husband and a wife should be. Mm. And actually the process of becoming egalitarian allowed them both to be able to better embrace uh, who they were at their core. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was in their book publicly, uh, I am, I feel quite comfortable saying this. So uh, Nikki's husband, Stephen, would talk about being in church spaces and being called too passive. Uh, mm -hmm. Christian ministers really shame men around mm -hmm. passivity. And really, uh, Stephen is someone who's quite thoughtful. Uh, he is not as immediately vocal as his wife, Nikki, who is very gregarious and outgoing and uh, has some incredible opinions that she loves to share. And so ultimately, the two of them had to first deconstruct, what did we learn about gender? Mm -hmm. What did those gender archetypes resonate with us, if anything? And then how do we define who we want to be as individual people and then practice the differentiation process of negotiating those uh, experiences together? So mm -hmm. it was a hard, but ultimately, to go back to the word freeing, really freeing process for them to be able to move their relationship into an egalitarian space that so much fit their personalities better anyway. That sounds amazing. I'm going to check out that book. I've never heard of it. Thank you for the recommendation. Um, yes. What other resources might you suggest to folks who are early in this process of deconstructing? Are there your podcast, of course. Um, are there any other podcast books, resources? I highly recommend it. It's a new book that came out in the last year called When Religion Harms You. I was oh. going to say that too. By mm -hmm. um, Dr. Laura Anderson. Yeah, uh, Laura's true. fantastic. Um, her book is more geared towards individuals, mm -hmm. uh, for individuals who are navigating with the early stage ramifications of leaving religious systems. That could be a church, it could be a relationship, it could be a geographic relocation. And when you realize, what the fuck did I just uh, survive and go through? Laura's book is a fantastic uh, mm -hmm primer on um, you know, some of the research around neurobiology uh, and trauma studies, uh, some mm -hmm. of the research on early practices of embodiment. And then also Laura provides a lot of insight about, uh, about some of the histories within the, the evangelical subculture mm -hmm. uh, that makes it kind of specific to folks who grew up in evangelical Mormon and Pentecostal spaces. So that would be a first place that I would go for folks who are just moving out of religious spaces. I would agree. And she has um, the podcast Sunday School Dropouts, yeah. which is another great resource for yeah. folks. That's amazing. Uh, well, we'll put all of the links to your podcast um, and to your coaching business and to these other books that you've mentioned in podcasts that you mentioned in the show notes for anyone listening. Um, where can folks find you if they want to work with you or they want to learn more? If folks want to work with us, uh, at this stage, we're in the middle of a rebranding process. Uh, we're excited to, uh, to talk with folks about that in the future. Drop down, let's heal together. Um, but for the, in the meantime, if folks want to work with us, uh, they can email us, sexvangelicals at gmail.com. Um, our website, which has our podcast, it also has a book club that we're hosting, uh, is www.sexvangelicals.com. And then we also have a sub stack. Uh, called Relationship 101, uh, which uh, we send out three times a week uh, that has 
a whole variety of relationship advice, uh, delving into uh, the, the research of communications, relationships, and sexuality. Amazing. And then we're also on Instagram and threads at Sex Evangelicals. Wonderful. Well, thank you both for sharing a part of your journey here today and and really helping to shine some light on what is hard, but also what is beautiful in taking this step forward for folks who make that decision. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you, you, for you so questions. much. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. I will see you back here next time. Thank you for listening to Get Naked with Dr. Kate. You can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Kate Balistrieri and on YouTube at Modern Intimacy. If you have questions you want answered on the podcast, feel free to email me at question at getnakedpodcast.com. Our Modern Intimacy team is here to help you and to provide you with support. Feel free to schedule a free 30-minute consultation at the link in our show notes. And don't forget to join our newsletter for insights, surveys, and articles sent directly to your inbox. You can sign up at modernintimacy.com slash newsletter. New episodes drop every Tuesday. I'll see you next week. Disclaimer. This podcast is not a substitute for therapy and does not constitute a professional relationship with me, Dr. Kate, or with Modern Intimacy. This podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only.